American University in Bulgaria. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm glad that so many of you are here. I'm glad I know many of you. I'm also glad I don't know many of you, and those of you who don't know me still came. So today, I'll be describing, I'll give you a hint of what cryptography is about. Okay, what this study is, what is the, the subject about, what kinds of questions cryptographers look at, and specifically, we'll look at Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which is the more specific part of the lecture. So the general part will be about cryptography. Now, I need two volunteers, two volunteers. Okay, Adeliada and Stole. Please come here. Now, I want you to come up with a common secret. So the two of you can talk secretly right there so that no one else can hear. And I want you to come up with a common secret. And let's agree that the common secret is a number. So you just have to agree for a number. Just agree for a number. Whatever number. It will be easy for you if it's an integer, but you can choose the number. <laughs> okay? So. Just make sure no one else hears. I'll keep talking in the meantime. So they're talking, and what happens is they will share a secret. They will both have a secret key, okay? It's like that key, so each one of them will possess a copy of the same key. In this case, it will be the same number. Okay, you just have to agree for a number, you don't have to. <laughs> okay? So can you, Stole, can you go there? Can you, can you go there? One of you goes there. You just oh, okay, just a second. You just have to come up with a common number. And now they have the opportunity to talk in secret, okay? Like this is what will be, uh, like we'll ask the question what happens if they cannot talk in secret. Are you okay? Uh, yes. Okay, can you go there? Now Adeliada will come up with a secret now. Now you remember the number, okay? Now Adeliada comes up with a secret. She wants to communicate that secret to Stole. But no one else should be able to figure out the secret. So come up with a secret, just a number, another number. You want to communicate to Stole okay. a certain number. So she came up with a number. The number should be part of the... No, just a number. Let's say you come up with your favorite number, you want to tell him that number, okay? Yeah. Now, if you tell him the number directly, everyone will hear that number. Instead, why don't you add the secret to your number? Add it. Okay. Now you can announce the addition of these two. Announce the result. <laughs> okay, announce the result. Your number. I should say the final you, result. The final result, yes. You add up the number and the secret. The number, the number that you came up with? Okay, uh, 73960. 73960. So. 73960 is what she announced. Now from this, can someone in the audience figure out her message, the number that she wants to communicate? Yes? <laughs> what? Well, if their secret was zero, that would be the message, but maybe their secret wasn't zero. But now Stole, can you come up with her secret? So from this you have to subtract your common secret. Okay. Okay. Our common, I mean, our common number was seven three nine three eight. So seven three nine three eight. You subtract it, you get five minus, You get twenty two. Was this the secret message? Yes. Okay. So she managed to send him a secret message through an insecure medium. Okay. And the thing is, they had a common secret, and we say that the she walks her message with that key, okay? So she, when she added her number with the secret, it's like walking her message, and he has the same key, with that key he unwalks, okay? But you know, when you walk the door and unwalk the door, you turn around the key in opposite directions. So she added the numbers, it's like turning the key that way when you walk the door, and he unwalked with the same key, okay? That's what happened. Do you have questions about that procedure? Okay, let's thank the volunteers. Okay. Now I want two more volunteers, but a pair of students who know each other fairly well. 
So people who actually know each other. <laughs> people like roommates, okay, you too, please come in. So what are your names? Mario, yeah? Mario and? Buris. Mario and Buris, can you go there? No, no, you go there, okay? Now you cannot, so here is Mario, Mario, and here is Buris. Are you roommates? No, but you know each other very well, okay? Now, you cannot talk about, talk with each other and come up with that common secret that they had 73938. If you have a number in common like this, it's very easy to send a secret message. Now, I want you talking over this insecure audience, insecure medium. Everyone listens to what you're saying. Come up with a common secret. You can talk with each other, you can, like, you can, describe what this common secret is, but you cannot announce the number because everyone else will hear the number, okay? So for example, like if it was me and one of my students, the student's score on the last exam could be a common secret, like just me and the student know that score. So you can have like the first letter of what you had for lunch or so, like some common secret that you have. Okay? okay. Well, you have to use a little creativity. The date of their last event. Okay, we don't know what event they're talking about, but they do. Can you add the month of it? Yep. Okay, and the month of it. So that's our secret. So they know the month of something. Okay, so you know secret is between 1 and 12. Okay? No one else can, like, we don't, we don't understand. First, first, first we had the date and then we added. Ah, date and then they added the, the month, okay? So, no one else knows what event they're talking about, okay? So, we don't know their shared, their common secret. Now, you come up with a secret. Another one? Yeah, just another one. Like, this will be the secret that you have to communicate. Okay, so you come up with a secret. Now, add the common secret to your secret, and you can announce publicly the answer. 40. 40, so you got 40. Now, from this 40, we have no chance to recover his message. But, he has that common secret. So from 40, you can subtract your common secret, and what do you get? Is this the message that you wanted to send? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you had maybe trouble with uh, think, once again. think once again about the date of the last event. It's <laughs> November. <laughs> it's in November. So 11, 11. You so have it's five. Yeah. Five. Is this the message? Okay. Let's thank the volunteers again. Thank the volunteers. Okay. Now comes the, the big task of cryptography. So suppose you have two people, two people, in all cryptography books, the two people are called Alice and Bob. And they have never talked before. They don't know each other, they have never talked before. <laughs> and they have no common secrets. No common secrets. <laughs> Like, they don't have any common events that they can talk about, okay? And now here, any communication is heard by an audience, okay? So, insecure uh, channel of communication. Communication. The question is, is it possible that they can obtain a common secret? Is it possible that they can obtain a number like this, what was it, 46,000 something, or the secret was 35 in your example, okay? Is it possible? So this is the big question. Is it possible for two parties who have never met before to exchange a secret. A secret through 
insecure environment, insecure medium. Okay, so from what we saw by these volunteers, if they have a common secret, then they can send secret messages, okay? If Alice and Bob know the number five and they agreed that their common secret is the number five, then Alice can come up with some number, add it to five. Actually, this, doing, this thing with adding the numbers is very naive. It's just a very naive example, okay? It's not used in practice. But you can imagine if they have common secret, they can do something complicated with the message and the secret. And then Bob, using again the common secret, can decode the message, just as what we did. But suppose they have never talked before. And suddenly, we ask them to come up with a common secret. I'm not asking for volunteers. Maybe no one will want to do that, okay? Because this is hard. This is the heart of cryptography, okay? Now suppose that they have to communicate over the internet, but they are afraid that any exchange, like Alice doesn't want to send her credit card number to Bob, let's say on the phone or over the internet. She doesn't want to send him her credit card details, even though she trusts him, maybe, although like if they have never met before, she wouldn't trust him, <laughs> but uh, let's say she wants to send him something secure, but everyone listens to what she's saying. She will never send any secure information. Or suppose that suddenly Bob is, uh, becomes the ambassador of his country and he has to send secrets to the government, okay? Anything that he sends, any communication will be read by whatever postal services or whatever third parties, okay? So Bob will need to have secure communication with the government and the first step will be to set up a common secret. So how can you get a common secret? So this is the question for today. Okay. And this is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So they have to exchange common secret. Do you have general questions? Like cryptography is about the kinds of things that we are trying to do. Okay? Now, to answer the question, what do you think is the answer to that question? Is it possible? Yes. 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 Does someone think that the answer is no? If you think the answer is no, like you shouldn't be paying banks by credit cards, you shouldn't be typing your password in the computer, you shouldn't be using secure email, okay? Like all of you should believe the answer is yes, but we don't know how it's done, okay? I'll give you a clue of how this is done. So to do this, so any type you enter a secure password in your browser, any type time you send your bank, your uh, like you log in with your bank account and so on, there is some mathematics going on. We're not aware of that mathematics. So I'll discuss it now, okay? So I'll start with basic stuff and then we'll build to the answer to the question. So let's start with the most basic of math. Namely, let's start with the integers. Integers are the numbers 0 plus minus 1 plus minus 2 plus minus 3 plus minus 201 and so on. All of these numbers. These numbers you can add and you can multiply. Add and multiply. And if you add two integers, you get an integer. If you multiply two integers, you get an integer. For example, if you add uh, 5 plus 31, you get 36, and so on. So we can do arithmetic with these integers, okay? Now, cryptographers don't like the integers. Like, why they don't like the integers is a subtle question. One of the possible answers is that there are infinitely many integers. They cannot store them in a computer, okay? Infinitely many. So instead of the integers, we're going to work with other numbers which will be finitely many numbers, but they will be as easy to work with as the integers. So what we'll do is called modular arithmetic. And I'll do it by means of an example, e.g. I'll define something which we denote by z. z is just standing for integers, so these are denoted by z. But then I do this line, 
which if you've taken any course that contains abstract algebra in its title, means mod out by, or if you haven't such a taken such a course, it means kill. Okay, this line means kill. And here I put 7z. If you've taken abstract algebra, this means the ideal 7z. If you haven't taken abstract algebra, it means any number that is seven times an integer. So you kill everything that is seven times an integer. So what this is, is, so this is all the residues, residues of integers when divided by seven. So when you divide an integer by seven, you get the residue. So what are the possible residues? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, and then six, and then residue seven is the same as like residue zero, okay? So these are all the possible residues. So there are just how many elements here? Just seven numbers. So instead of infinitely many integers, we're going to work with finitely many numbers, just seven numbers. So these are just seven numbers. And in many ways they are better than the integers because like, they are finitely many, you can store them on your computer. And also you can add and multiply anything you can do with the integers, you can do with these numbers as well. So what do you think? So you can do arithmetic. The only difference is that arithmetic for the integers, just like this one, five plus 31 equals 36, we learn this in elementary school. And arithmetic like this, we learn, learn later in our mathematical careers. That's the only difference. Otherwise, this is as easy as that. Okay? So for example, I claim I can add one plus two. So if I add one plus two, I should get another number among these ones. Which one do you think we get? Three. Okay, as easy as this. How about let's add four plus five. Okay, so four plus five, if we think about the integers, would equal nine. But nine is not here. I should get a number among these ones. The residue of nine, when divided by seven, is two. So I'm writing equation like that, okay? I'm able to write equations like this. So add the numbers as if you're adding integers and then record the residue. So this looks like, looks like we've written, we've written, what have we written if like, if someone skipped that and comes right now? It looks like we've written seven equals zero. Seven equals zero. So in our language, seven is equal to zero. Okay, so that's why I'm saying that this means you kill seven times an integer. So seven times one for us is equal to zero. That's the notation. Don't worry too much about the notation. So let's do another example. What is six plus five? Okay, so in the usual arithmetic, six plus five would be 30, but 30 is not here. What's the residue of 30? Well, 30 equals 28, seven times four plus two. So I write, this is equal to two. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, six, six times five, yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Six times five is 30, so the residue is two. Uh, so this looks like, We've written, let's see, 30 minus 2, 28. So it looks like we've written 28 equals zero. A multiple of seven is equal to zero. Uh, how about, let's do six plus five. So in integers it would be 11, but modulo seven, when you divide by seven, the residue is equal to four, okay? So conclusion is these numbers you can add, you can multiply, you can work with them as well as you work with integers, okay? Some of you maybe have seen that, okay? Some of you have seen this. Actually, I claim that all of you have seen this. In fact, 
all people who are at least eight years old have seen that. Okay, let me ask, uh, except you haven't seen ZMOD 7Z. You what is the example that everyone in the world has seen? The clock. Yeah. The clock, exactly. So ZMOD 24Z. The more familiar example, familiar example is ZMOD 24Z which is 0, 1, 2, all the way to 23. This is the clock. So for example, everyone can answer the following question. Question, suppose you start studying at 22 o'clock, okay, at 10 a.m., and you study for uh, let's say you study for five hours. When do you go to sleep? When do you go to sleep? Now, the wrong answer, wrong answer would be to write 22 plus five equals 27 o'clock. This is wrong. There is no 27 o'clock, just right here, there is no number eight, okay, or 10. The correct answer is 22, you start at 22, you work for five hours, well you get 27, but the residue modulo 24 is three. So you finish at three o'clock. Okay, so this is modular arithmetic. Everyone have seen how it works with the clock. When you add numbers, you don't add them as integers because you get large numbers, but you will get one of these. So you reduce, you take the residue modulo 24, and in this case you get three, okay? Does this make sense? Yeah. If you have taken abstract algebra, how is this thing called? What? Modulus, no, like this, this is called the quotient, okay? So you mod out, or you mod out. How many of you have taken abstract algebra, one of the two courses, just to have an idea? Okay, one, two, three, four, okay? But even if you haven't taken abstract algebra, that's how you add and multiply. Now, let's go back to back to Z mod 7Z. So I'll be looking, working with these residues. What I can do is I can take the number two. We can take any number, let's take the number two. And let's prepare a table with all the powers of two. So two to the first is equal to two. What is two to the second? So we multiply two times two, you get four. Okay, what is two to the third? You have to multiply four times two. When you multiply four times two, it's eight. The residue is one. So here you put one. Eight is equal to one in our, for our numbers, okay? Now, what is two to the fourth going to be? Two. And then the pattern repeats because every consecutive entry is two times the previous one, okay? So the powers of two, powers of two are just the numbers two, four, and one, okay? When you take two to any power, you get two, four, one, and then again you'll get two, four, one, two, four, one, two, four, one, okay? No power of two is equal to three, okay? So we say that two is not a primitive root. Primitive root would mean that if you take the powers of two, they will give you all the non-zero numbers in the set, okay? That would be a primitive root. So let's take, let's start with three. Start with three and let's prepare such a table. So three to the first power is three. What is three to the second power? Exactly, two, because nine is equal to two in our system. What is three cube? You have to multiply this by three, so you get six. What is three to the fourth? So 
three times six is 18, the residue modulo seven is four. Yeah? 14 plus four is 18. Now you take the next one, three to the fifth, three times four is 12, the residue is five, okay? So three to the fifth is three to the fourth, which we already computed is four, so four times three is 12, the residue is five. Then the next one, three to the sixth. What is three times five? One. It would be 15, but in our numbers, it's one. Do you agree that working with these numbers is actually easier than working with the integers? It's easy because even if you raise three to the power of 1,000, it will not be a huge number. You can keep, what is three to the 1,000? You can compute from here. Like three to the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and then it loops again. Seventh, eighth, ninth, three to the tenth will be four. So three to the tenth doesn't get very large. It's easy to work with these numbers. Okay, so powers of three are all the, the number, all the elements. You see, one is here, two is here, three is here, four, five, and six. All the elements are here. Are all one, two, all the way to five. Okay, so when you take powers of three, you can get any possible numbers. Number, okay? Okay, so we say that three is a primitive root. So three is a primitive root. That's what we say. Now, <laughs> do you have question about that? Notion of primitive root. So. Question. Question, is four a primitive root? Let's prepare a table. Four to the first is four. Four square, 16, what's the residue of 16 mod seven? Two, and then four cube, will be four times two, eight, so one. And then if I do four to the fourth, it will be what? Four again, I go back to four. So I do four to one, and then four to one, and so on. So four is not a primitive root. So primitive roots is a number like three. When you look at its powers, they give you all these numbers, but in, in a mixed way, okay? It mixes up the numbers. The powers of three are all the numbers from one to five, but in a random way, okay? So primitive root will be the key mathematical concept behind that Diffie-Hellman key exchange, okay? So now, now accept, accept the fact that five is a primitive root. Accept that fact, okay? How would you check that five is a primitive root? You would draw a table like that. You compute all the powers of five, you notice that you get all the numbers, so you can check that five is a primitive root. But I don't want to draw that table, let's just accept that five is a primitive root. Okay, so problem, where, Starting from scratch, from the integers, starting from the basic things, and very soon, like we're very close to the uh, crux of the matter, okay? We're almost there. So problem, find, find x, find x, oops, such that, such that five to the x is equal to three, in z mod 7z. Okay, so we know that five is a primitive root. What does it mean that five is a primitive root? All the powers of five are all the numbers. 
Therefore, some power of 5, we don't know which one, will be equal to 3, okay? Some power of 5 will equal 3. Okay, so we know that such an x exists. So this problem, we're solving equation. It's called the discrete, how do you think it will be called? If, if you're not working with these weird numbers 0 through 6 with our addition and multiplication, how would you, like if someone comes in late and looks just at that, what would that person say? x is equal to what? Logarithm, logarithm of 3 with base 5. So this is the actual calculus type of logarithm. So here it's called the discrete logarithm problem. Discrete because we're working with just seven numbers. Okay, so this is the discrete logarithm problem. How would you solve that problem? We can draw the table. We can draw the table so we can start uh, listing the powers of five until we see three on the right column in the table, and then we're done. And like, we're really close to the crux of the matter. So we'll do, we'll do exhaustive search. We'll be doing exhaustive search. So there is no conceptual way. You look at this and you say, okay, x has to be whatever. Okay? You have to start listing the powers of five. So you do the table. Five to the first is equal to five. Five to the second, 25 is equal to what? When you reduce mod seven uh, is equal to four. Five cube is equal to, so 20 mod seven, six. Then five to the fourth, 30 divided by seven will be two and five to the fifth will be three. Have we solved the problem? Yes, so by doing the table we found five to the fifth is equal to three. How many steps did we do? How hard was that problem? We did one, two, three, four, five operations. To solve this, we're basically doing a lot of operations. Okay? We do exhaustive search, like we just list the numbers one after the other. So, uh, no matter, no, so, no method, much better than that, than, than that, has been found so far. The way to solve a discrete logarithm problem is just by listing, like, by just doing that table, drawing the table. H4, now, let's come here. And here is the idea. If instead of seven, if you take a bigger prime, so instead of, instead of P equals seven, we can take, so prime number, let's take 56509. This has five digits, okay? It's a bigger prime. And now solve uh, two to the x is equal to three, eight, six, seven, nine in Z mod, in Z mod, uh, five six five zero oh, nine z. So here two is a primitive root. So two is just like the number three there. So let's accept. So accept that two is a primitive root. So accept the fact that the powers of two will give you all the numbers. Okay. So some power of two. Let me make it in red. So two to some power is equal to that particular number, okay? How would you search for that x? Like how would you find x so that two to the x is equal to that? Uh, using what? Machine, yeah, but what would you do with that machine? How would you program? 
so the, the, to program, you will be as you will be computing the powers of two. Okay, so compute, compute two, two to the first, two to the second, two to the third, two to the fourth, two to the fifth, two to the sixth. You just do that table. Okay, when I had z mod seven z, the table was very easy. It was just seven multiplications that we had to do seven operations. But here, how many do you? Like how many will guarantee that you have found the solution? Until you get to that number, okay? So we have to do 38,000 operations. Not that 38,000 is a lot. 38,000 is nothing for computers. But, well, if you do it by hand, it will be a lot. So until you get, until you get to uh, two to the 11,000, 235. So if you do it that way, you do 11,000 operations. So if this number is, is P, so if P is 56,000, um, this thing is, so around how many computations, roughly speaking? 55 divided by 11, five, so about around one fifth of P operations. Those of you who, are, who have taken calculus two or numerical analysis just for fun, this thing in the books will be written as big O of P. Big O of P means a no more than a multiple of P where you don't care about the multiple. Don't worry about that if you haven't taken calculus. Okay, so around one fifth of p, but a number times the actual prime. Okay, so next question. Question, what if p is really large? What if p is huge? Say p has um, 300 digits. What if P has 300 digits? There are ways, I'm not going to discuss them, to generate prime numbers with 300 digits. Okay, uh, huge prime numbers. I, I, if I write it on the board, the board will not be enough. And then, if instead of P equals 56,000 something, you have P equals something with 300 digits. And if you want to solve this, Exhaustive search. How many operations will exhaustive search require? More than the age of the universe. Exactly. So, 300 digits. It's one. Th those of you who are in computer science, it's 1,000 bits. So, if you represent numbers in base two, binary numbers, you need 1,000 digits in base two, which is a huge, huge, huge number. You have never seen that number. It's more than the life of the universe. So if P has 300 digits, then the discrete logarithm problem is infeasible, like is computationally impossible. Impossible. If I give you a prime with 300 digits, there is no way. <laughs> and I, ask, I tell you that two is, say, a primitive root, accept the fact that two is a primitive root, and I ask you two to which power is equal to, and here I write something maybe with 290 digits, in Z mod that number, which has 300 digits, even with the best computers, which do trillions of operations in a second, you cannot solve that discrete logarithm problem. Okay? Does this make sense? Questions so far? So the heart of the matter is the discrete logarithm problem. Now, now we are ready for that Diffie-Hellman key exchange. <coughs> So here is Alice, here is Bob. 
They have never met before. They don't have any common secrets. They can talk, but everyone else hears what they're saying, okay? One of them is standing here, the other one is standing there. And they have ne never met before. They're not like the two of you, okay? They don't have any events that they can talk about. What they do is they pick P, huge prime number, huge prime number, P with 300 digits. In the past, when computers were, were smaller, you could have taken P to have 50 digits, which is still like 10 to the 50th is still a huge number. But nowadays people believe that you should be taking P with 300 digits. So they take enormous number and then take G to be a primitive root. And there are number theory ways to generate big primes and primitive roots, okay? There, it's not that Alice is computing P and G and making it secret. They're computing it together. Maybe trusted third party will give them P and G. They can look up P and G over the internet. Just they have to announce P and G. They can then put it on their websites. Everybody knows P and G, okay? Everyone knows what prime they're using, okay? Now, Alice picks a random number A. So both of them are working so work in Z mod PZ. So P is that huge number. In our example, P was seven. Z mod seven Z is what we looked at. But think about Z mod, instead of seven, you take a huge prime. Now Alice picks a secret. So this is her secret key. Okay, this number A, she doesn't tell anyone the number. No one knows that number, just she knows the number. She computes g to the a. So she raises g, the primitive root, to that power a. And that, I can explain it a little. Let me not interrupt that, I'll explain why raising g to that power is very easy computation. If g has, if p has 300 digits, raising g to let's say a 300 digit number is not that uh, difficult, okay? When you raise to a big power, it's not difficult at all, okay? So she can compute that on her own computer. And she makes this number public. So she sends th that number to Bob. So everyone can hear the number G to the A. They know what P is, they know what G is and they know the number capital A equals G to the A. Let me make A in red. So is it possible for the public <laughs> to find little a? So attackers, attackers know G, they know A, and if they want to find A, they need to solve, well, G to, they know G, they don't know A, and they have to solve G to the A equals capital A. Okay? G is public, capital A is made public. Alice announces capital A. And attackers, if they want to figure out her own little secret, they have to solve this. But this is like that, except with huge numbers. Even with the best computers, they cannot find little a, okay? So from that information, they cannot recover little a. Does this make sense? To find little a, they will have to solve the discrete logarithm problem. Now, what, what is b doing, Bob? Bob chooses his secret b, secret. No one is going to know b. Even Alice, Alice will never be able to figure out b. And Bob will never be able to figure out A. They don't care about A and B. Bob computes G to the B. G is public. He raises it to his own secret and announces this number G to the B. B equals G to the B. <coughs> this is also public. So all the attackers know capital B, they know little g but they cannot solve the equation g to the b equals capital B because this would require 
millions of years. Okay? Okay, so public is P and G, the primitive root, and these numbers, G to the A and G to the B. And computationally, you cannot find A and B. Okay, now how, how can Alice and, what was the task? What are we going for? Does anyone remember? What was our goal? To share a secret. Now, to send a secret message, we think of this as a second step. The first step would be to share a secret. You remember the first two volunteers, they shared a secret. If they share a secret, then it's easy to send over secret messages. The hard point is to get to a common secret. Number that both of them know, no one else knows. Okay? Okay, so what Alice can do, this is the beauty in that uh, piece of math that it's actually very, it uses very simple ideas, just ingenious ideas. So think about what Alice can do. She knows the number A, her own secret, and she knows the number G to the B. G to the B, also everyone else also knows G to the B. So she can take that public number B, capital B, and raise it to little a. So she knows the number g to the b raised to the a, which is g to the a times b. Okay? g to the a to times b, Alice can compute. Is it possible for attackers to compute g to the a times b? No, because attackers know g to the b, but they don't know a. They know g to the a, they know g to the b, but how can you get g to the a times b out of g to the a and g to the b? No way. If you multiply g to the a times g to the b, you would get g to the a plus b. Okay? So the knowledge of g to the a and g to the b doesn't give you g to the a plus b. Here is what Bob can do. Well, Alice had sent Bob capital A, which is g to the a. And Bob can take that number and raise it to his secret. So Bob can take a to the b, a to the b, which is capital A is g to the b, raised to the a, which is again g to the a times b. Okay? So Alice has a secret, sends g to the a. Bob has a secret, b sends g to the b. G to the B is public knowledge, but only Alice can raise it to the eighth power. So Alice can do G to the B to the eighth power, which is G to the A times B. And the Bob, uh, well, Alice can do G to the B to the A, which is G to the A times B. So both of them can compute G to the A times B. None of them knows both A and B, and the public knows neither A nor B. What is the common secret? G to the AB, exactly. Both of them know that number. And no one else from that information can recover the number G to the AB. So now, G to the AB is a common secret. Both of them can compute it, but the knowledge of the public, which is g to the a, g to the b, they have no way to recover a or b. So from g to the b, they cannot get to g to the a times b. And this is a beautiful piece. Does it make sense? Okay. Now, one thing I have to explain. Uh, Okay, let me give you an example. So, EG, <laughs> EG, let's, pre let's take P equals 7. P equals 7 is like small, but just to illustrate. And let's take 5 as a primitive root. So, here is Alice, here is Bob. So Alice chooses a secret. Let's say she chooses A equals 3. 
No one knows that number, three. And she sends over the insecure channel the number five to the third, which is what? Five times five, 25, which is four. So four times five, 20, uh, so six. So Bob receives six. And let's say Bob's secret is B equals two, and he sends the number uh, five square, five square, which is 25, reduce mod seven, four. So Bob says, okay, I received the number six, so I raise it to the second power. So Bob computes six square, 36 is what? One. So Bob computes x squared equals one. Alice receives the number four, so she computes four cubed, which is, uh, well, 64 divided by seven, 63 is divisible by seven, so Alice also computes one. Now they have that common secret, one. And the public knows that five raised to Alice's secret is equal to six, but pretending these were huge numbers, the public wouldn't be able to recover Alice's secret. If the public recovers Alice's secret, it would be a disaster because then the public can take that number and raise it to Alice's secret. Okay? So that's, that's the main idea. There is one thing that I have to say. See, if you imagine that instead of seven, you have a number with 300 digits, and A is some pretty random number, maybe again with 300 digits, okay? <laughs> and let's say B is also something with 290 digits or 300 digits, okay? Then Alice will have to take the primitive root and raise it to the power which is her secret. So the question that you need to ask is, well, won't it be too hard for Alice to raise the primitive root to a number which has 300 digits? And what is the answer? Not really, okay? So, uh, raising to a huge number, uh, let's say n, requires let me first say it, not that many steps. I'll say this in three different words, depending on what math courses you have taken, okay? So I can say it requires not that many steps. What is the meaning of that? Like if you have to compute five to the 20,000, it's not that you do five times five times five times five times five, 20,000 times. That's not what you do, okay? That would be, that would require way too many steps. If the number has um, 300 digits, this would require as many steps as a number which has 300 digits, okay? So you don't do that. Instead, what would you do? You do an algorithm called, well, you look at the exponent. If it's even, then you compute five square, so you do one computation, and then you raise this to 10,000. And then you compute the square of that number to the 5,000. Then you compute the square of that number to 2,500. Okay, so you square and multiply. Square and multiply. So that reduces the number of operations that you have to do. So, what is another way of saying requires how many steps? Let's be a little bit more precise. Let's, yes? Uh, big O log two of n. Big O, let me put it in here, big O of log of n. Okay, that's for those of you who know what big O is. And for those of you who don't know, let's say it requires no more than two times log two of n steps. Really, the logarithm is what tells you the number of steps, okay? 
So if you have to raise a number to the 64th power, so eg, x to the 64. 64 is two to which power? Two to the sixth. I claim for this you need six operations. You don't need 64 operations. Well, what you do is you take x square, raise it to the eighth. So you have computed that. Now you take the square of that number. So you take x square square, this is a computation, raised to the fourth. So this is a number now. So it's, uh, let me say, b to the fourth. You have computed b. Now you don't do four steps. You do, you do one step and then you square. So instead of b times b times b times b, you do b square, which is one operation, and then you square, which is another operation. So to raise five to a huge number requires walk of that number steps, okay? So to raise it to a number which has 10,000 digits in base two, we require, which has 1,000 digits, we require something like 2,000 operations. 2,000 is nothing. 2,000 is done in a second by the computers. But two to the 1,000 is impossibly for computations, okay? So I made this a little bit like accessible to kind of a wider audience. If you actually get to cryptography, it's a little bit more technical than that. I don't want to mislead you, but it's a little like, uh, here you ask all sorts of questions. What if there is someone who interrupts the conversation? Like what if they communicate through a postman? And the postman, instead of G to the A, sends Bob some number that the postman decides, <laughs> okay? Then it's still possible, but they have to do some more work, okay? And then there are all these questions of authentication, like how is Alice sure that that number was sent by Bob and not by an attacker, and all kinds of questions like that. And the other thing is, this discrete logarithm problem is actually not as hard as I described it. There are some attacks on the discrete log problem. So if you want to use cryptography, I can be really sure that no one can break the crypto system, you have to do a little bit more advanced kind of maths. You have to do something, has something called elliptic curves, okay? It gets a little bit more advanced. But already on that level, it's still very interesting. You can do a lot with that. Okay, well, this is the beginning of the subject and cryptography is developing right now very fast. Okay, it's not one of those subjects that, it's not like the thing in your calculus textbook that was discovered by, by Archimedes, okay? It's currently being discovered. This program is brought to you by AUBG Talks. For more, please visit us at aubg.bg talks.